Moffat. That's the order for round one of the 1982 Australian Touring Car Championship at Sandown Park. Oh, somebody else has uh, had it there on the inside. Holden Curran. They skirt wide. I think it may still be the same car, oh. just expiring rather <laughs> further. <slowly. laughs> Well, that dice for uh, second and third has uh, opened it up for Dick Johnson. He's established a very commanding position going up through Rothmans this time. A great start from Moffat. A disaster, though, for everyone else because he put Brock behind him. And he's now almost out of touch. He's got to get by uh, Kevin Bartlett. That'll be hard because KB drives hard and fast. Very fair, but he's got a big car and he'll use all the road he's entitled to. And it'll be a great battle watching these two. Alan Moffat will get a first-class view of it because he's very close. Peter Jansen, the yellow car coming through the bend, he had a bit of a disaster in the first race and expired before he covered one lap, but he's going well now in a car which is really a pretty old machine now, and he's getting a new car for later in the year, and he's trying to give it a bit of a go, I think, and see what he can get from it. He's running back in fifth place. Brock, seeing whether he can outbreak. He said he won't outrun him because they haven't got the legs, but he's going on the inside, decides there's nowhere to go there, just pokes his nose out to remind Kevin Bart that he's around. Straightaway speed, not a great deal between uh, Kevin Bartlett and Peter Brock. Alan Moffat just sitting off them after playing cat amongst the pigeons there for the opening lap and a half. Bartlett goes through Arco, the left hand, and now Moffat closes it up on the back of uh, Peter Brock. And Brock is on the bumper of Kevin Bartlett. A real race for second, third, and fourth. Moffat, I think, wisely biding his time now, content to sit there just for the moment and see what these two in front of him do, because if either of them make a mistake, he's going to be through before you can see which way he went. acceleration to get by the Chevy Camaro out of corners. He can't out-corner him because uh, Kevin Bartlett goes pretty hard. He must be saying, now, where the devil can I get by him? Because here's a car with fairly similar characteristics to my own. It's a slightly lower car than the Camaro. People talk about the big uh, Chevy, but it's a little bit lower than the Commodore, rather. And it is a bit heavier, but it has a bigger engine. It'll be a it'll take a power of passing. And, of course, in Kevin Bartlett, he has a man without peer in terms of experience and racecraft. Brock now going for the outside. Bartlett on the inside, but he'll move across. He'll take the quick line through the corner. There he goes. He gets a good switch. view of Peter Brock in the mirrors. Maro a little skatey getting into that corner. And a little bit skatey getting out of the corner. And uh, Alan Moffat now moves up uh, right on the tail of Peter Brock. Still Bartlett second. Brock is third. And look at Moffat. Right Moffat behind is, Peter Brock. You know, Mike Raymond, Moffat has made a great deal about the reliability of the Mazda, but the big trick with this car is it's lightweight and this great braking, and he's using that braking to devastating effect, leaving his foot off the pedal till the last possible moment and closing up on the big B8. And it's Alan Moffat's daring and the lightweight of the Mazda that's giving him the real advantage here, and he's going to give these two a bad time before this race is over. A little bit of Daytona drafting there as they went over the rise with uh, Kevin Bartlett in the 9 Camaro and uh, sitting right on his bumper, of course, is uh, Peter Brock. A little back behind them is Alan Moffat, but he really has to have the car wide up through some of the cement dust there. I reckon they're catching Dick Johnson, Mike. They could be, because Bartlett certainly picked the pace up. Brock is close now, though. Look at the spectators in Sandown's grandstand. Really stirring Moffat on, and also Peter Brock to get out and pass Kevin Bartlett. Point two seconds, a gap between the first and second car. One could say between the first and third. Bartlett still holding down second place, just ahead of uh, Brock. Moffat parked in behind them, but it's Dick Johnson uh, out in front. Uh, less than 11 laps to go at the present time. 4.2 seconds is the margin between Johnson and Bartlett. You can't measure the distance between Bartlett and Brock. There's just not enough space. Bartlett gets away a little bit, uh, has used those slower cars to a bit of an advantage over Peter Brock. You can see the gap there between himself and Brock. And as Evan said, uh, I think they are gaining a little on Dick Johnson as they go into the middle stages of the race. There's Johnson. He's already managed to pass those slower cars. Bartlett. Right behind him is Peter Brock, who has to tuck in and Moffat caught on the outside. Now, if there's a chance to pass, that's going to be uh, down the straight. The Penrith Mazda coming into the, the pits. Not all the Mazda's enjoying the success of Alan Moffat. He's really flying the flag with the stiffest possible flutter. That was Terry Shield in the pits. Alan Moffat's out on the track, right behind this pair. Sitting away for um, Peter Brock. 
under 10 to go. Dick Johnson really doing it well. The True Blue Falcon out in front. Cutthroat war going on between Bartlett and Brock. And Brock really, I mean, he's got no chance of uh, uh, hauling Johnson in unless he can get around Bartlett. And Bartlett's determined that that is not going to happen. Well, he certainly won't catch him up the hill here because the Chevy has the legs. These how they are after six laps. It's a race over 16 laps, so there's still 10 to go. And you can see the gap, 3.6 seconds, so they've gained six tenths of a second on the leader. Only 0.3, though, between uh, Bartlett and Brock. They've managed to pull away just a little bit now from Alan Moffat, who was right on their tail earlier. The significant thing, uh, Gary, is that if they can maintain that six-tenths of a lap margin, they will get up on his tail before the race is over. So we might get these two getting close to the man we're seeing now. Dick Johnson is leading. Of course, Johnson, knowing he's got a margin, may just have backed off marginally. He's certainly driving a very comfortable race, but comfortable is not the word you could use for the scrap between Brock and Bartlett. Brock is trying to be outside. Bartlett is just tantalising him. He said, there's the road. Do what you can. He knows he can't get by. He comes sweeping in to take the line. And Brock has to be content with that view of the wide yellow tail right in front of him as they sweep past the pits with nine laps to go. Warren Cullen, meantime, is still holding down uh, fifth position. And uh, Murray Carter has moved into sixth ahead of Peter Jansen. I think uh, Kevin Barton is intent on moving that Armco out of uh, Arco Corner just out about another three metres with some of the, uh, the slides he's pulling through uh, the left-hander at Arco. But here he comes along the back stretch up to uh, Rothman's rise and stretching just a little bit over Peter Brock. Brock is quick from this part of the track, closes up on Bartlett. As you can see there, they were making ground on Dick Johnson. Johnson is uh, probably 100, 150 metres ahead of him. If he Moffat has a weakness, uh, Mike, I'd say that corner is where the Chevy kicks out. It's not Kevin, it's the fact he's got a tail-heavy car, and maybe a bit of a tyre problem with this tremendous heat. He's got a heavy car, and the tyres will be going off. Peter Brock will have noticed it twice now. Kevin Butler's gone wide there. He says, OK, his back tyres are going off. I'll give them a go. Just really pressure to get these tyres so warm that they don't press now. Can Will Brock keep on going on that line? I don't think so. No, he moves across. But I think he knows he's got a bit of a chance now because the tyres are starting to go off for Kevin Butler's car. Eight left to go, and he certainly doesn't need to give it a go. While we watch them, let me just run through the field, because we can't show the others, and we don't want to leave this dice between these leaders. We know the first three. It's Johnson, then it's Bartlett, then it's Brock, and we've got Alan Moffat right behind. Drop him back a little bit, but still within two seconds. The next car is car number 12. That's Warren Cullen, isn't he, Commodore, in car 18. Murray Carter. Rock moves up. Murray Carter, yes. Great Murray Carter. He really does turn in magnificent efforts. Then it's car three which I can't find. Peter Jansen. Peter Jansen. Oh, car eight, it must be. And car four, which is Alan Brown in the Commodore. Number eight, Gary Wilmington in the uh, Falcon. And number 27, which uh, is Stephen Harrington from Tasmania in the Roadways Commodore. Ahead of 55, the first of the class cars, George Fury in the Nissan Australia Turbocharged Bluebird. The car going very well, but about half a lap behind these, giving away a lot of capacity, 1,800 cc's, but turbocharged, and a pretty good rundown effort, I'm sure, as far as the Nissan racing team is concerned. But the action is up front. And it's Dick Johnson who's leading it. You can see his pursuers there, one of them about to uh, gather in a strong bow, I'd say, as he licks up one of the slightly slower masters right behind and getting increasingly frustrated over think. You can see again how Kevin Bartlett hung the tail out there. He didn't want to, but he just can't control it. Those tyres are hot and they're starting to lose grip. And now if, if there's to be a move made on Kevin Bartlett by Peter Brock, he'll be up on the S's up the top, I'd say, because he will try and provoke him into a tail slide. Let's see what happens. In the meantime, as they go up the back straight, it's Johnson out on the right of the track and going flat out as he passes some of the slower traffic. <laughs> Well, Johnson's played it uh, smart and he's had the car to do it. He's been first man off the grid uh, and he's highballing in front and hasn't got the worries of uh, a cutthroat dice uh, with anybody else on the track. He's leaving Bartlett and Brock to do that. They're the placings. Johnson in the True Blue Falcon, car 17 in front. 4.2 seconds ahead of the Camaro of Kevin Bartlett. Kevin held it fairly well that time, just touching the dirt, but the tail's still sliding a bit. Peter Brock is quicker through there and this is where he's trying to make his move, but Bartlett has the power. He puts it down. Brock taking a tight one there, being a little untidy, just to try and sharpen up the corner and get through. Immediately, Kevin rolls to one side to break the toe, and they're playing real ducks and drakes here, swinging across the track. He doesn't want to give him the aerodynamic benefit of towing him on, but he's given him the best line if only Brock had the legs. But he's just once again saying, OK, pass me if you can. He knows he can't get by, and Brock is content 
Once more with that wide yellow view in front of his, uh, his bonnet. He'll be trying to get a very fast line, Will Brock, through here, just to get the pace to get out and counter the extra 700 cc's Ooh. of the car. Look how that car is starting. His tyres are going. Brock gained himself maybe a couple of foul there. Gets up tight. He'll be wound up. He's a little bit quicker up here as he has the revs out of the corner. It all counts. And this is where he might make a move. Bart was not going to give. How good are the brakes? How good are the tyres? Those are the questions in both men's minds as they come over the top well, of the, the Rockman Rise. Well, the now that uh, another lap or two of hard pushing like this and uh, the opening might just come for Brock. Just over five laps to go. So <laughs> he really is only going to get one chance probably and when it comes, he'll have to grab it with both hands and run. Kevin Bartlett has slowed down a little bit on that corner. He's doing it very cleverly. He doesn't want to slide the car. He's just saving a few hundreds there just to try and conserve the tyres. He's content to see Peter Brock move up on the tail. He knows he can out-accelerate him, or at least keep in front. And he's walking Brock through that corner just slightly, just to try and cool the tyres down and save them for the last few laps. They only have another five to go. Kevin Bartlett still in second. Peter Brock third. Alan Moffat is fourth. We picked them up coming on to the short straight on the approach to the left-hander at Arca. Dick Johnson still with a very firm hold on this race. Brock with it. One of the Nissan Bluebirds there, the turbocharged cars, pulling over to the left, doing a, a stunning performance for a class car, giving away so much size in terms of engine capacity. Doesn't have the power, though, and you can see it there being passed by Alan Moffat with his uh, peripheral ported rotary, who scoots away. But certainly we're going to see more turbocharged cars in that race, you can be sure of that. In car 55, the George Fury driven car for Nissan Australia. A very distinct straw in the wind for the types of cars we're going to see. Telltale signs of just a little brake lock up uh, from Brock there on a couple of occasions. A problem he did suffer in the first heat earlier in the day as well. It was checked, but obviously they still need some adjustment there to get, uh, get things set just right. Still Please, uh, clinging to the tail of Bartlett. And throwing that Commodore around uh, through the uh, S's. Bartlett at this stage gets away the run, gets away from him in the straight and Moffat now starting to make his move he's starting to close on them a little bit more slower car getting a little bit of swish there from uh, Peter Brock didn't leave him any room and he didn't have to either there's Moffat coming through behind those I think both these cars might be suffering from being involved in such a heavy duel uh, situation that's uh, escaped as far as uh, concerned. he's having a nice run which he can do at his own pace but we've had uh, Kevin Bartlett flinging the car very heavily and probably upsetting the uh, the tires a bit. We've had Peter Brock braking very heavily where he goes deeper into the corners and maybe doing some damage as far as his brakes are concerned. And both cars are probably in a bit of distress because they've been battling so strongly against each other. In the meantime, the lead by uh, Johnson, the Queenslander, is now 4.5 seconds, so he's not being caught. He's maintaining the lead he had some laps ago. and Brock continue to battle and uh, as we said before this is the shape of things to come for the 82 season with Moffat poised right on their tails waiting for the mistake it's going to be uh, a rip roarer well we just mentioned Moffat and what about that man and his aspirations for the 82 season How important is the 1982 season to you, Alan Moffat? You've been racing for a long time now. Your first race at Sandown back in 1964. Oh, Evan, your statistics are too good. I don't like to think that far back. Uh, every season is important to me. I wouldn't get in the car if I didn't want to try hard and go well. I've got a terrific product, and uh, we're looking forward, certainly, with our uh, uh, reliability factor to finish the races. And if you finish, you've always got a chance to win. So we'll be trying hard. He doesn't know any other way, does he? No, he doesn't. You know, the, the effort of trying hard, uh, Gary, really can uh, result in some uh, exhaustion today. It's terrifically hot out there. If you look at Peter Brock, he's running in third place. He notes on the straight, he's got his hand out the mirror. Oh, there's Peter Jansen retiring from the second heat. He'll be disappointed, but he has a new car coming. George Fury retiring the turbo Datsun. The heat would have been the last thing that team manager Howard Marsden wanted because the turbo was a hot engine to start with. And today's 37 plus degrees. There's, Dick, there's um, the battle between Bartlett and Brock. Well, what's Brock? Make it another few. You see his hand out the side of the car. I thought at first he was shaking his fist. What he's doing? There it is. He's getting air. 
I'm sure he's trying to drag air into the compartment. He's suffering from the heat, I'd say, because he's following that car. There's no air coming in because he's in the hot air of that ship. And he'd be driving in an oven. That would be a most uncomfortable run for Peter Brock. No air in the engine of the car and no air coming in the cabin. You watch on the long straights. He puts his hands up. Bob Lockett went very wide then, by the way, and lost a bit of time back there. You may just have seen the Mazda go off on the board. And he will have dropped back another 40 metres, but he still holds on to a strong fourth place. Brock trying to get out from behind the uh, the air of the Chevy, gets to one side, got his hand out the side bit, then pulls it in because it slows the car down. There's tremendous force when they're doing a speed of something like, uh, well, let's talk in old terms, 150, 160 miles an hour up the straight. They're going very quickly. Now, Dick Johnson, the race leader, but this is where the real race is at the moment and has been for much of the event, this uh, tremendous battle for second place between Bartlett and uh, Brock. Only just over a lap to go, in fact, for the race leader, Dick Johnson, uh, is there time yet for Brock to get through here and snare second place ahead of Bartlett in the 9 Camaro? Moffat dropping back just a little now in the Mazda RX-7. Not uh, sufficient time for him, I wouldn't think, to mount a challenge on the other two for this minor end of the prize money. On the last lap for uh, Dick Johnson and also now for Bartlett and Brock. We'll certainly cover the race in uh, every aspect as far as uh, Kevin Bartlett and uh, Peter. Oh, full tail slide wow. job by Kevin Bartlett. Brock was a little uh, skatey too, getting into the Repco corner down here, so I think that their tyres have gone off a little. But Dick Johnson has done a stir. Oh, Bartlett just shaving the trees down there on the Armco. That may have given Brock his only chance to catch up a few metres. Now, the only place he can capitalise is on the back straight. The, the place we should watch, though, I think, uh, Mike, will be up on the bench because there's no doubt that the tyres are going off the big Chevy tomorrow. Well, this is the last chance, isn't it? Coming up now, they're just about to go through uh, Rothmans, Bartlett and Brock. There they are, and it's Brock's last chance. Johnson out in front of them will take the chequered flag. Bart will need all his experience to try and conserve the car. The tyres are going up. You can see there he's going very slowly to avoid it. spinning. He's got Brock right in his tail. He'll slow Brock down. And Brock will be cursing there because he just can't get by and he won't have the legs to out accelerate him. And uh, as they come through the bends, it'll be the Chevy Camaro in front. Now, can, can hit Brock it up. It's Johnson who takes the flag. A great hit to the Queenslander. And who'll get second place? That's how they finish. The Chevy Camaro, Kevin Butler, just in front of Peter Brock in the Holden Commodore. And if that's the way it's going to be, Mike Raymond, it's going to be a good year. I think it's going to be a fantastic seat. Obviously, the uh, highlight race of the program here at Sandown today, the first race between the, uh, the touring cars was just as thrilling. Um, and the battle, of course, that uh, raged between Kevin Bartlett and uh, Peter Brock indicating uh, no doubt that we're in for a great season of uh, the touring car championship don't take anything away at all from dick johnson who had to get off the line first and hey he did it the smart way he did it the smart way yeah let it didn't get involved in all that uh, scrapping and all that hullabaloo uh, Dick could be smiling. I mean, he really has uh, done it pretty easy under the circumstances. Well, he won the Touring Car Championship last year and was awarded the James Hardy Classic at uh, Mount Panorama. Uh, one race that he's obviously looking forward to going back to later in the year. He'll be appearing at uh, Amaru Park at uh, Channel 7's next televised motorsport meeting out of uh, Sydney in March. And I think Dick... Uh, Johnson would be very satisfied indeed with his uh, performance today and what a great battle uh, uh, Alan Moffat uh, on particularly on some of these smaller tracks such as Amaru Park uh, he's going to be on equal terms uh, with uh, Dick Johnson and also uh, Peter Brock most people here today have been drinking the ice but Dick Johnson is using it in the back of his neck it must have been very hot out there Dick yeah actually even after the first race we put a pirometer in the car and the the interior temperature of the car was 145 degrees so in this monkey suit, it's very, very hot. Yes. You look pretty hot there too, Peter. You had your hand out trying to scoop air in, it so it seemed, because you were behind Kevin Bartlett all the time. Come up, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, uh, it doesn't help the uh, temperature problems in the car. In fact, it felt like a blast furnace coming out of the uh, interior ventilation system, which obviously picking up heat through the plenum chamber, but unfortunately, uh, I had no brakes, so I had to sit behind old KB there and watch his taillights. There you know what it's like without brakes, Peter. Yeah, we were pretty even, weren't we? <laughs> It seemed to me, Kevin, that uh, I don't think you've ever driven a harder race or a more canny race, but you seem to have tyre problems towards the end. Uh, yeah, the tyres started to go off, sure. Uh, not as badly as they did on, on the first race, but... Uh, there was no way, no, I mean, I catch Kev, but you couldn't pass him, so uh, as long as he kept on the island, drove correctly, it was Kev's uh, second spot, so congratulations to him. You both wanted over the presentation. We'll let you go there. Thank you for sparing this time. In the meantime, it's back to Gary Wilkinson.
very much, Evan. You know, it's amazing, uh, Mike, that really the outcome of that race was told in the first 200 metres, wasn't it? And the dash uh, from the starting grid down to the first corner. It certainly was. Uh, as far as uh, today is concerned, uh, I think two heats over 16 laps of the Australian Touring Car Championship has been the real tribute to champions. OK, let's have a look at the uh, replay of this. This was quite a, uh, an interesting first corner. Phenomenal start by Dick Johnson. And this is where he uh, won the race. And uh, Moffat made a remarkable start. And that's really what put uh, Brock behind the eight ball. It put him in the sandwich. OK, Brock gets off the line a little bit sideways behind um, Dick Johnson. And Moffat quickly parcels up uh, Peter Brock. Bartlett finds a little scoop down the inside and says, make your own arrangements. And when, by the time they'd entered the first corner at Repco, Moffat had the tail out. Bartlett was trying to renew acquaintances. And then he took uh, the chase up to second and that effectively blocked uh, Peter Brock out of it. OK, from that we'll go down to our Prime Minister is that uh, the Light Car Club and World Classics have put on this day for uh, the rest of us to enjoy. It's uh, not only the uh, touring uh, car races, which many people follow keenly in Australia through the season, but to see uh, world champion drivers uh, bringing out the old cars for us to look at and driving them uh, pretty fast is something which I think many people here have enjoyed enormously. So thank you to the Light Car Club and to World Classics for making that possible. We've just seen the... Uh... Well, you're a bit slow. If you do it, you know, if you clap a bit more, they might do it again. The, uh, we've just seen a great race. Dick Johnson uh, was um, unchallenged uh, and ran a copybook drive. Many, many congratulations, Dick, for the way you took out uh, the first heat and the second heat today. Kevin Green now talks to one of the great motoring enthusiasts. Thank you, Gary. Well, there's no greater motoring enthusiast than the Prime Minister, and I'd like to ask you, Mr. Fraser, what's your favourite car here today? Well, I think that's very hard, but um, probably that old P3. Uh -huh. Now, you like Italian cars like I do. I think you're a bit biased. Well, I might be biased, but in, in 1935, to imagine that uh, old P3 driven by Nuvolari beating the great, huge, modern, powerful German cars of the day, which were much more modern, had the total backing of, uh, of Germany at the time, and that, you know, one game Italian, and a brilliant piece of machinery by the time it was outdated. And, you know, that was a, a magnificent driver and a great car. And it, it was out on this, this track today, what, 40 years later. Do you enjoy the modern racing as much as the older cars? Well, maybe not quite as much, but I, I think I haven't had time to watch it and, you know, it's harder to tell which car it is sometimes if you only look at the races occasionally. Um, to me, a, a car is something with the engine up in the front and great big long bonnet. But that, uh, that's a mark of age, a bit, so i better stop that. You, you must find it hard as an enthusiast to get in the sort of driving you'd like. Do you get the chance to drive much these days? Oh, not very much. Uh, but, um, you know, occasionally somebody lends me an interesting car and I take it down to the farm. The roads are fairly open and vacant. Not much traffic around, uh, but uh, you know, cars are changing, and good cars are within reach of most people these days, which wasn't the case 20 or 30 years ago. And cars of great performance too. Really, these modern cars have outstanding capabilities in terms of road holding and braking, well, don't they? I think this is where the cars are improving enormously in road holding and braking, and, and they certainly needed to because, by by good stand, this is one of the reasons why I first liked the Lanciers because. For generations, they've been good road holders, no matter what their engine power was, and therefore they were safe. Good road holding and good brakes. And many cars that were mass produced and whatever uh, didn't follow those standards. Well, now it's good to see that um, the major companies, the mass produced cars, are paying a great deal of attention to road holding and brakes because they realize that this is the kind of primary safety that people need if they're going to save their lives. It's a real instance of motor racing improving the breed, to use the old cliché. Well, I think it does. I really do, because obviously out here you've got to uh, have cars that are safe, that will stop when you ask them to stop. And uh, um, people sometimes forget it's just not a car to go from here into the city or whatever. If something goes wrong or if a child jumps out in front of you, you can't necessarily foretell that. And uh, even if you're going quite slowly, 
You need a car that will perform well, that won't slip if it's wet. And uh, this is where good design is so important. I think you'd have made a great motoring rider. Well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it comes naturally a little bit, but um, I enjoy it. And I've, uh, I've always um, you know, done a fair few miles in the year for no other reason than I lived quarter, you know, 250 miles out of Melbourne. And so naturally I was driving a fair bit. And I wanted something that was comfortable, safe, and uh, uh, gave me a feeling of security. So I've always looked for these things. I think it's great, and I do thank you for honouring this meeting by your presence. Our Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, and it's back to you, Gary Wilkinson. Thank you very much, Evan. And by gee, enthusiast is hardly the word, is it, uh, for the PM? He really is wrapped in all this, and obviously is a great lover of uh, uh, great cars. And, you know, it, the thing that uh, we've probably tended to overlook is that uh, one man, perhaps more than any other, has helped to make this uh, tribute to the champions here today with the provision uh, of uh, most of these uh, wonderful, uh, well not most of, but some of the rarer uh, of these wonderful cars. And uh, Evan Green is now going to talk with the man who's helped to make it possible. Tom Wheatcroft is reputed to have the largest collection in the world of racing cars. He's also known, according to the press releases, as a multi-millionaire, so I'm tempted to ask you, Tom, what do you do for a crust? Oh, you hear these stories, you know, these multi-millionaire things. Uh, so someone dreams about it. Well, you do own the Donington uh, Museum and the racetrack. And oh, you, yes. And you have how many race cars there in the museum? Uh, there's 102 in the museum at the moment. There's and 64 more to go to get the world collection. So you're out for the world, for the complete lot. You've got the... Um, the, new, the whole range of BRM, I believe. You've got, what, 13 BRMs there? Yeah, yeah, we've got 13 BRMs and the first transporter, which was a purpose-made transporter, the first one ever. And very interesting, that, because every car and the transporter always run on Dunlop tyres. And they're all lots, all on Dunlops, and we hope to run them before this year's out, because they've never been seen together, let alone run together. What do you regard as your favourite cars? Um, well, I very much like the 250F Maserati that's here. The simple reason I like it, it's so easy to drive, it's forgiving. And also a uh, four-cylinder front-engine BRM called the P25. I like that, it's a very talky engine. An old fellow like myself can jump in it and have a little bit of fun. And Well, you own all these cars, you own a racetrack. Do you ever get in these machines and drive them around? Yes, not, a, not as much as you'd ever imagine. Less now I've got a racetrack than I ever did before. I don't know why, I couldn't tell you. Um, but probably a couple of days every summer, I'll get two or three friends and we have a day there playing like children. We think we're still in Moss and Fangio. But... Bill Patterson in the Cooper Climax, in which he won the Australian Gold Star Championship in 1961. The glorious Mercedes W154. Trying to see whether it's Jack Brabham or Denny Holm at the wheel. Uh, it should be Jack Brabham. It is Jack Brabham, indeed. Jack, Jack had, uh, as he said, some troubles in stopping when he was out last time and took $800,000 worth of priceless motor car, if you could forgive such a mixture of words, onto the grass. That, um, which must have had the, the heart, the fluttering of the people from Dame Le Benz who.